Well, uh, not much to say, um, but it's a war. And um, I think it came out really clearly. I'm really, really pleased uh, you all came out tonight. And um, I'm Don Cook from the McCormick Foundation, also a board member of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, former staff person at the Field Museum. I've had a lot of jobs, I guess. But our uh, guests today have come a long way, and uh, I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, they've come from Montana, from the United Kingdom, and they've come from Zambia. And um, What's great is they represent all parts of this discussion, the big picture, uh, all the way down to the boots on the ground in Zambia trying to stop the, the front end of, of the trafficking. So let me just quickly introduce them and, uh, and have, uh, have them talk to you. And then it'll be a Q&A time. Uh, John Hemingway, uh, uh, one, two, three, from my right, uh, is uh, Emmy Peabody and DuPont Columbia Journalism award-winning writer and filmmaker, and he is the producer, director, and writer of that wonderful documentary. <laughs> now, guess which one Sally Case is? She's the CEO of David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation. She's a barrister from the UK, but focused on animal rights, wildlife crime, and conservation. So thank you for coming. <clears throat> and Sport Beatty in the light blue has a tie on. This may be unusual for him. <laughs> He's the founder and CEO of Game Rangers International based in Zambia. Uh, honorary warden of the Greater Kafue National Park and longtime conservationist, and he's the one with the boots. So th thank you for coming. <laughs> and uh, to moderate the discussion, uh, my good friend from my days at the Field Museum and ever since, uh, John Bates, associate curator in the zoology department and uh, uh, a, a bird expert, among other things. But John, thank you for coming and for having the Field Museum be part of this. Ladies and gentlemen, the panel. Thanks, Don. Uh, so the format of this is uh, I'll ask a series of questions from the panel to, to kick things off, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions from the audience. So I hope you, you'll build up some of those and you'll get a chance to ask them. We'll start with uh, talking to John. I mean, the documentary makes a startling, compelling connection between global ivory trafficking, warlords, and terrorism. Um, it highlights the, the issues associated with the danger for game wardens and also for poachers. Um, is this a state of war in Africa? Yes. Uh, I don't know if this is working, but I have a loud voice. Um, I think it is a state of war. Um, I, I do believe it is a state of war. The, um, uh, perhaps you recall in the film that, um, that sequence of uh, that, that episode where we're on the Dungu uh, Pika Road up to the border with uh, southern Sudan. Um, we saw just a cross section of over 30,000 young kids who had been abducted um, and, and um, uh, brought into, you know, real life slavery um, by Joseph Coney over the last uh, 32 years, and um, and suddenly, I realized, and we all realized, Brian realized, all our team did, that this is not a conservation issue anymore. This is a, a geopolitical issue. Um, it is a humanitarian issue. These are kids who are uh, being used to carry this ivory up up north. It um, quite, you know, a little uh, footnote is there was a slave trade in this part of the world um, going back to, as far as we know, 1850, perhaps e earlier, and they are taking the same route today that they were in 1850. Uh, and these are modern day slaves. And this is modern day pillaging of um, natural resources. So in answer to your question, I think it really is um, a, a state of war. 
Um, I believe that were we to show this to rangers in Kenya, in Zambia, um, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, they would all feel like a band of brothers with the guys in this film. By the way, it says in the film, four people have died since then, 10 have died as of now. Um, I think it, it uh, comes to the heart of um, what Africa is, its natural resources, resources they're being pillaged. This is just one story of the pillaging. So uh, it's clear that, that one of the issues is trying to get the governments in these countries to, to get more involved. Are things like this making a difference with respect to that? Is, and I think that that could also be brought uh, to bear with respect to the US government. Yeah, really great. Um, I, you know, I guess that's why I make these films, um, and I love to tell these stories, um, because th this film and the previous film before this did have impact in Kenya, and uh, the First Lady of Kenya um, has, according to her um, testimony, you know, uh, become the first First Lady of Africa to ever take on a conservation project, and she's taken up the elephants in a big, big way, and she's a wonderful woman. Um, and I believe the impact is being felt in Kenya. But we're talking about a lot of other countries here, and um, I don't think this film has had any impact in uh, the DRC, or the C uh, CAR, or the South Sudan, where it really counts. And, um, and I don't, I think we're running out of time. I, I, I mean, you know, there used to be 22,000 elephants in this gorgeous place called Garamba, Northeastern um, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now it's 1,300 on a really good day. So, um, and in, uh, in South Sudan, the, the numbers have gone from about 145,000 down to under 3,000 in just a few short years. I mean, I could go on, but this list is just a, a, a tale of woes. But um, I believe the answer, if you're asking for an answer, is to stop demand. And that's another subject altogether. But if you could drop the price from whatever it is today to 5% of what it is, um, that would, um, this stuff would stop and elephants would rebound. And, and by the way, in a place like that, if you don't have any, any elephants anymore, what's the point of the park? And, yeah. that, and that's the bigger issue that is going to happen as a result of this. So I want to bring in the rest of the panel here and, and, and uh, sport, I mean, Zambia has had some success stories in the sense that the populations declined for, for and actually rhinos went extinct um, back in the 70s and 80s, but in elephant populations declined, but they've come back. What's going on now? Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you very much for having me tonight, and uh, thank you to the Chicago Council. Thanks to Laura Dodge from Equal, Susan from Absolute Travel, and to Ian Whitaker from... And thanks very much. So I think to answer your question, uh, John, Zambia is trying its best. I think uh, I, I can only speak at... If you, if you talk of illegal wildlife trade, there's three distinct parts. John's already mentioned the demand, which is the destination then there's transit and there's source. So I can only really talk about source and transit. So what Zambia is doing within the source and transit domain um, is really just trying to keep things as simple as possible um, and support the guys on the ground, the men and women, the rangers, um, to provide them with all the necessary support that they need to be able to do their jobs. Um, and I think what's encouraging, because, um, and forgive me John, but. It is quite a doom and gloom video, but within Zambia there is hope. And I'm very pleased to say that recently there was an African elephant census report that was done, sponsored by Paul Allen's Vulcan Foundation. Um, and they've discerned that the populations in Zambia for the most part, although not in all parks, but for the most part are stable um, and are poised to increase. If we can at least continue to provide the rangers with all the necessary support that they need. So I, I take a slightly different stance to John. I think 
if you can deal with source and transit, um, you can also mitigate the problem which is afflicting most of the national parks in Africa. So would, would the poaching in Zambia be the same kind of situation that exists up in, in a place like Garamba? Or is it mostly local people? I think even in Karamba, the poaching is done by the local people. They, they are the people best placed to, to do the killing, if you like. It's, for me personally, um, you know, last year we arrested 368 poachers with just 100 rangers. Um, and, and many times you feel quite sorry for the poachers because these are just people who are trying to make a living um, and it's all about the risk and the value, the perception of risk versus the, the perception of value. So if the perception of value is higher than the perception of risk, which in most of the developing nations it would be, and certainly for local people living next to the national parks who don't really benefit from the national parks, um, it's, it's an easy decision to go poaching. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's difficult when you apprehend poachers and you've got to send them to jail and you ask yourself if that really is the solution to, to the problem. Um, and I don't think it is. I've got a question for Sally in just a second, but I wanted to also ask John one more thing is, is I think everyone will notice that the tusks, the last time they're seen is actually in Sudan. Is there any information about what's happened, what happened to them afterwards? No, sadly there isn't. Um, one of three things um, happened. Either they were found out, um, the batteries went dead, or they're still in a uh, metal container um, and um, they will beep. But the issues are always the battery life. And um, I think that even since this film was made, we, we have even better batteries, it's a big, big industry. Um, so it, it's a bit of a cliffhanger. So where do I think they would have gone? Uh, from all indications, they would have gone through Port Sudan out to uh, China. Um, they could also have gone to a place called Omdurman, north of Khartoum, and headed straight uh, north into uh, Egypt, where in Luxor there's almost a, an open market uh, for ivory, and um, um, CBS has, um, has um, a film of Chinese buying ivory there in large lots. Um, so I don't know, but, uh, but watch this space and we will have an answer for you one of these days. Sally, this is obviously getting into your realm of, of the international aspect of all this. What can, what can group, these international agencies that we have out there like CITES and Interpol do? There's a, a sport identified, there are three key uh, stages to this, this problem and it is tackling every single one of those stages. So um, if you take Interpol, for example, they would be best placed to deal with the transit section where you're talking transnational, international um, crime routes. And as John has already indicated, what uh, we have learned from our undercover investigations is that there is a common route out of the ports on the uh, east side of Africa across to countries like Thailand, Vietnam and Laos. Uh, Laos in particular has a very locked down system which tends to hide some of the kingpins and keep them away from uh, investigations and then we have clear evidence that the routes go from those countries into China. Um, I'll let Sport pick up on Interpol just in a moment because I think he's best placed to tell you how Interpol works um, on the ground. CITES is the, um, uh, the Convention on uh, International Trade in Endangered Species, so specifically looks at the trade um, aspects uh, for wildlife rather than the protection aspects, although you'd think there'd be um, a lot of overlap there. So when the conference meets in this September to discuss uh, how much trade is permitted in all of these animals, uh, you have all the countries with different stakes in this process putting in their bids um, for certain levels of trade. And obviously there are some African countries that believe in sustainable use and trade of some of these species, and there are some that take a very protectionist stance and want to lock down trade either permanently, which would be ideal, or at least until populations have recovered. Um, from our perspective, we say no trade never, because all the time the trade is 
on the horizon all the time. While it's a possibility, criminals are stockpiling, governments are stockpiling, and the stockpiles are leaking into uh, the illegal markets. And of course, while you have a legal system of trade in some countries, domestic trade, uh, that allows the illegal trade to proliferate underneath. Um, corruption is rife, illegality is rife, and so the whole time there's this confusion. And I think until we have a permanent, uh, forever trade ban, particularly in relation to ivory, then this situation can't be tackled completely. The sports that it's just about mitigating. Sport, do you want to comment about Interpol? <laughs> Sorry. All right, so I need to be careful what I'm saying. <laughs> um, we, we've actually worked very closely with Interpol in the past. We did um, a big operation with Interpol uh, a couple of years ago called Operation Worthy, which was a simultaneous operation conducted across a number of African elephant rain states. Some good results were obtained, um, and it felt like we were moving in the right direction with the likes of Interpol. Um, yeah, I'm going to crucify myself here. I, I, I'm going to be honest, because I think unless we talk straight, these problems are never going to fix themselves. Um, I feel Interpol could do more. Um, there's a reluctance to work with NGOs. Um, and unfortunately, the reality is that most of the developing nations require support from NGOs like ourselves, like David Shepard Wildlife Foundation. There's, there's, a, there's a whole plethora of NGOs doing fantastic work, working in partnership with uh, local authorities. Um, so I think there needs to be a, para a sort of a paradigm shift in the way we work um, with Interpol and the way Interpol works uh, from a certain level to ground level. Um, and I think until that happens, we're missing an opportunity. So Sally, do the international courts play any kind of active role in any of this? Not to date that we've seen. I don't think we've, um, certainly in the, the undercover investigations that David Shepard's personally been involved in, uh, we haven't seen the results through to that conclusion. These are enormously complex, highly sophisticated criminal networks in many ways. Um, and as I say, some countries are capable of giving a safe haven to some of these criminals. And of course, as soon as you take one kingpin out of the equation, another three will pop up into that space because it's such a lucrative space. And so what we found to date is this, this slightly shifting, moving spider web uh, arrangement that whilst you do action in one place, something else pops up. Uh, that's not to say that it's not important to take these people out and make sure that wherever possible there's due process and they're put before the courts. What we found most effective so far is shining the international spotlight. As soon as somebody realizes that they've been exposed, other people don't want to trade with them anymore, um, they have to change and shift their arrangement. But what we seem to be doing more of with more success is that, that continual poking and prodding process so that they can't um, get on with their business in an ordinary manner. But the, these are you know, seriously dangerous criminals uh, and the people that are involved in them have to be extremely careful about what they do and how they do it exactly as you saw in the film. And I think as you guys have laid out, this, this whole issue of the three parts is really important. So coming back to the source for, for just a second, obviously this is happening in a place with very low standards of living and, and a lot of poverty. And so a rhino horn or an elephant tusk is worth an awful lot of money. How can you, can? it seems to me you have to get to uh, eventually countering the financial incentives to poaching. So how, how can you do that? Yeah, I think that's, that's a big question. Um, there's, a, there's a number of answers. I think from my point of view, just based on my experience on the ground is that whilst the destination is, you know, to focus on the destination and change mindsets and bring all the legal ramifications into place. You've, the, the quick way to, to mitigate this problem is to support the boots on the ground. Um, so I'm probably going to sound like a stuck record tonight, but that, that's what we do and that's what we find works quickly. You get a good, res, a good return on investment very quickly. Coming back to your question, John, you know, the, if you look at a national park, certainly in Africa, um, the first line of defense is the local communities. The, these are the people that live contiguous to the national parks. They're the people who are most affected by the animals which live within the national parks. For example, you know, livestock gets killed by lions, crops get raided by elephants. So in fact, most of the local communities have a, a disdain for wildlife. They don't see any benefit from wildlife except loss of crops and, and, and in places like Zambia, you know, many people get killed from wildlife every year. 40, 50 people every year.
get killed from wildlife. So until we start to bring tangible benefits to the local people living next to the parks, um, I think that's when you'll see a big change in how the local people um, will look at poaching and even get involved in it. And they, ideally, you would want the local people to become your first line of defense. In a, in, a, in a perfect system, you would have no anti-poaching activities within the national park because all of your communities living around it would be informing you as soon as a poacher came from outside passing through their communities to go into the parks. But at the moment, and it's not in, in every case, but in, in many cases, the local communities are actually harboring poachers. And, and the people that pull the triggers, the poachers themselves, are coming from those local communities because they don't benefit from, from the wildlife. So we have to change that. Um, and that there is a process of change. There's a lot of local people being employed in the lodges. There's, there's a hunting industry which employs local people. Um, but it's not enough. Um, and, but that's a slower burn. So whilst, whilst we find ways to ensure that the local people benefit with, with tangible benefits in their pocket, we have to still focus on what needs to be done right now because as John's highlighted in the video, we only have about 10 or 15 years left if we're lucky before um, elephants are completely extincted from many of the national parks. Um, 25 years ago, I came to the US to give a series of talks on wildlife as a Rotary Exchange student. Um, and in those days, I used to talk about uh, the rhino in Zimbabwe, which is my native country. And there was 2,000 rhino left in the Zimbabwean national parks. And we used to think that was bad. There's less than 100 today. Um, so things can happen very quickly. Um, and unless we change the way we do things, in 10 years' time, we might be sitting here talking about just the last 1,000 elephants that we have to protect before the species goes extinct. And I don't think, um, you know, before poaching and stuff was more of a problem for Africa. But I think you can start to see that there's a problem here. It's a global problem. Um, and it's starting to affect all of us. Whether you live in Chicago, beautiful city, or you live in New York, or you live in Zambia, this is a problem which affects all of us now. Um, and so, I would encourage all of you to think about how we could try and change and how we can find solutions. So I'd like to use the last couple minutes we have. I mean, John has obviously presented this incredible documentary and I'd like the three of you to consider talking about your specific groups and the, and, and the things you do from the perspective of, of this whole issue. John, you wanna? Um, <clears throat> so, so um, I, I, I've always, um, I, I went to Africa when I was 16, I fell in love with the continent. To this day, I think it's the most important continent around. I think that a lot of geopolitical decisions are gonna be made on the basis of, of Africa. And I also feel that if you spend some time in Africa, particularly in the bush, and uh, it's very hard not to fall in love with the elephant. And um, I also feel that um, if you can't protect the elephant, you can't protect anything. Now, there are um, a number of animals that are in grave danger in Africa. One is the pangolin, but I very much doubt that I would have a film here to show you and get the same audience um, for the pangolin. I, I don't know people would, would bother that much, but it's a very, very grave issue. And I believe that, that if we can solve a lot of the, um, the demand problems for elephants, I think there'll be a trickle-down effect, if you excuse that highly inflammable political rhetoric, um, there'll be a trickle-down effect on things like pangolins and rhinos and, um, believe it or not, on lions, too, which are being, their bones are being exported to Asia as uh, would-be tiger bones. So. I do believe this is a big issue. Now, I personally, I think this is your question, John. I'm sorry to be so long-winded. Um, um, I, I have supported a number of organizations in my life, and I've thrown my heart and, and um, mind in them. The African Wildlife Foundation, I was chairman of that for a while. And um, I, I now very involved with a little group called Wildlife Direct, which is just one extraordinary 
woman in Kenya, Paula Kahumbu, who um, has the bravery to go and to um, pound on the table of President Kenyatta and get things changed. And she has successfully changed some of the laws in Kenya. Up until about three years ago, if you were caught with a bunch of ivory in your, in your luggage leaving uh, Joma Kenyatta Airport, it would be um, uh, about $200 and a slap on the wrist. Today, it could be as much as a quarter million dollars and life in prison. We think that's good. So we are going to open it up for, for, yeah. for, for so, questions, but, but just before we do this really quickly, I'd like to have, give Sally a, a chance to uh, give a quick uh, rundown on the David Shepherd Foundation in, in a nutshell. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation was established more than 30 years ago. Um, by a world-renowned artist called David, David Shepherd, who is very much uh, still involved and as passionate today as he ever was about wildlife conservation. But our ethos is very much the holistic approach. So as we've heard tonight about the three stages of the, the process, the problem, um, we believe in tackling all of those, each of those. Um, and it starts with sports work on the ground, and that is literally boots on ranges. These guys who put their lives on the line uh, in dangerous territories sometimes don't even have a pair of decent walking boots to patrol in those, those areas. And so that's really, really important to us, that, uh, that, in, that understanding that from the other side of the world we care enough uh, to provide that for them. And it goes as far as, as radios for batteries, solar power charging stations for their mobile phones so they can call their families to tell them they're safe, uh, up to um, the raincoats in the monsoon season in India. All of that is so, so very important and it's cheap. It's really cheap and easy to provide. From there we go to the, uh, the transit stage and we fund undercover investigations. We don't care if it's dangerous, it needs to be sorted, it needs to be exposed. Um, we've had good successes with those, obviously those aren't public profile uh, issues very often, but we're really keen to expose those routes and increase understanding and bring in those intergovernmental organisations who can, can do things about it. Um, one of the things we fund are um, real-time international conferences of law enforcers, so that people can exchange information um, and share intelligence. And finally, at the policy end of the process, the demand, because without demand for ivory, none of that would be an issue. Nobody would want to buy the ivory that Joseph Coney was trying to traffic there. So what we need to do is address that uh, lawful supply in the market to get rid of any covering up of the illegal trade. And one of the big things that we need to achieve this year is a complete and total ban uh, for the ivory trade so that there are no possibilities of this on the horizon. I think there's a myth or a preconception by some of the African range countries that ivory could be a commodity that could be traded in. And yet if you look at the size of the demand industry, just a tiny growth, a tiny increase in the middle classes uh, of, of wealth in, in China and those demand countries could completely uh, wipe out the entire population of African elephants. They're not a species that can be farmed for their ivory. It's almost impossible to meet that demand through natural die off. And of course, in the meantime, all of that lawful side of things is covering up what's going on underneath. So that needs to be stopped as well. So that's what we do. We try and tackle it on every which way we can. But it goes right down from simple, easy things to provide to those big policy issues at the top. Well, thank you. We now have time for a few audience uh, questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, I'll take uh, Adele Simmons on the, on the front row there, please. Thanks, Patrick. Please wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Thanks, Adele. You talked about the demand in China. Has there been any effort or any possibility of getting the Chinese government involved in reducing that demand? Yeah. No, I think very, very recently, um, there have been unprecedented um, statements on demand from, uh, there was a joint presidential statement from President Obama and President uh, Xi Jinping of China, which is absolutely unheard of uh, if you're a campaigner in the ivory trade. Uh, arena. So, very good signs. What the reality will be, we don't know. The commitment was to a nearly complete ban, I think the language was, and there's no timing around that. Uh, Chinese officials that I spoke to said it could take as many as 10 years, which may be too late. Um, but the, uh, in the international forums that we hold, China are now very quiet. Um, previously, they would advocate trade positions very strongly, very forcefully. And this year, for the first time back in January, they were quiet. And somebody described that as the loudest silence in the room. So there is a real sense that the super tanker is turning, but there's a fair way to go yet. 
Next question on the front row here. Thank you. I have a question for Sport. Uh, it was about how you feel when you find these elephants slaughtered in the way that they've been in such a tragic, horrible way. You weren't supposed to ask me that question. <laughs> Um, yeah, of course, you can't, you saw it for yourselves on, on the video there, you can't but help feel, I think there's a connection between humans and, and animals in general, but certainly between humans and elephants, dolphins, all those animals and mammals which are really quite close to us, uh, although they don't look like us. So, yeah, I've, obviously you feel, you feel angry, you feel upset. I think the biggest emotion I feel is frustration because it's a problem that we can solve. Um, and so I keep saying this to everyone I speak to, is that if we can at least support the rangers on the ground and give them all the equipment they need, even looking at the rangers in that video, who I've never met before, but I see so many similarities in the way they're dressed. Um, the one guy, you know, they, they, they're a rag matag bunch of guys, but they're doing their job, um, and hats off to them. But, so I, I feel frustration. Um, but you can't let that get in the way of the job that needs to be done, so you put it out of your mind. And one of the great tra tragedies of, of elephant poaching is, um, as John highlighted in the video, is the poachers don't just go in like a hunter and shoot the biggest elephant. They go in and they, they literally spray bullets. So you end up with elephants that die, elephants with bullets, uh, you know, that we have to come behind and, and, and dart them and treat them. But most unfortunately is you end up with elephant orphans. So one of the things we have been doing in Zambia as a result of the poaching that is going on is rescuing orphan elephants because of poaching. Uh, we've attended more than 30 rescues. We now look after 13 orphaned elephants, um, ranging in size from a year old up to 10 years old. And the whole idea is to at least give those elephants a chance to go back into the wild. And, and, and at the rate of poaching, those might be the last 13 elephants that, that get looked after. Um, and that's a, it's a huge um, drain on our resources to look after these things, but you can't walk away from that. You can't, and that's, uh, yeah, it's quite emotional. Can I just, just add to that? The, rate, the current rates of poaching mean that roughly every 15 minutes an elephant's killed for its ivory illegally. So while we've been sitting here tonight, I make that an hour and a quarter, five more elephants will have been killed, and that's really quite mm. shocking. Um, it's quite a powerful thought, I think, to realise it's been, you know, it's very real. It's not just something we've seen on footage. It's, it's real and happening, happening right now. This question in the, in the, in the middle there, Patrick. <coughs> well, I'd like to thank you all very much for education, the enlightenment, and the inspiration. It's been really amazing. Somebody before um, all of you wowed us uh, asked about making a contribution. And it sounds like there are great opportunities to do so. How? <laughs> Always contributions are welcome and necessary. There is never um, enough money to do all the things that we want to do. But I, I, I will say, because Sport won't say it himself, Sport has the most amazing operation. I know there's a couple of people here tonight who've been out and seen it. It is quite phenomenal what this man has achieved from literally dirt on the ground in Africa to, I think, employing over 170 local Zambians to, to keep this area of Africa safe. But the area of, of the park that Sport works in, he can keep about a third of it covered. He needs three times as much to do the whole park, and that's just one park in Africa. So anything you can give would be gratefully received. Um, we're able to funnel funds through to Africa for Sport and can... Uh, gratefully cover milk for baby elephants, boots for rangers, training, anything, all of it, please. Maybe I can just be, because this is not an opportunity I get very often, so thank you for that question. <laughs> 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 I'm going to try and uh, just hold myself back a little bit, but thanks, Sally. I'll just give you an, an example. Kafui National Park is 15 million acres in extent. Um, I've, I've been told it's the same size as Massachusetts. We support 125 frontline rangers. We need 500 if we, if we really want to secure the park. With 125 rangers, we've managed to, in five years, stop not all the poaching, but at least stop the decline of elephants. Um, and so the Paul Allen uh, African Elephant Survey 
confirmed that the African, the elephant population in Kafui is stabilized. Five years ago, it was pegged at 3,500. This year, it was pegged at 6,500. Our annual operating budget is $670,000 today. So that's roughly $100 an elephant per annum that we are investing into Kafui National Park. And it's not enough. Um, and so in a, in a rough sense, three times of that would, would, would definitely help. Um, but if I was given one ask tonight, it would be to ask for a helicopter. <laughs> and I know that sounds like pie in the sky. <laughs> but that's what we need. We need a helicopter because Kafui National Park, to get from where we are to a poaching incident in the north of the park, which is 100 miles away, takes us more than three days. So you can't not respond, but you know that when you respond, by the time you get there, the poachers are gone. So having a helicopter, and we've already proofed the concept. We, we hired a helicopter. We got some funds. We hired a helicopter. A heli this is a small helicopter. We're not looking for a, a fancy helicopter, just a good <laughs> second-hand helicopter. Anyone got one? That can, so the helicopter we use, sorry, I know I'm taking up time. It, carry, it can only carry three scouts at a time. So it was two trips because each patrol team is six people. But to the furthest park in the national park, and Kafui National Park is the second largest national park in Africa. So to get a whole team of scouts to the furthest point took us 51 minutes. So in 51 minutes, we had a whole team on the ground. And there were no poachers there because we were just doing a test. So the whole, the whole thing for us at the ground is to get the team onto the target as quickly as possible. And right now, a helicopter is the best way to do that. Yeah. Well, well, unfortunately, that's, that's all we have time for, but please join me in thanking the panel this evening, and thank you for coming.